are um, welcome. My name is Julia Egan. I'm director of development with East West Food Rescue, as well as an active board member. Um, I'm a resident of Woodenville, and I love the community that we serve and the fact that when we come together, we really truly can make such a huge impact. Um, and that's going to be expressed a bit more in detail um, as East West Food Rescue is celebrating our one year uh, since being able to be born out of the pandemic. Um, as well as celebrate our one of our many food agency partners um, with Fiatato of Lend a Hand Community Outreach. So I want to first just give a notice that for the individuals who are missing um, and unable to attend tonight, we're going to go ahead and record the presentation. Um, and we do have a chat box uh, that's going to be monitored. So if you have any questions that are coming up as our speakers are, are sharing, um, please go ahead and enter those questions in the chat box. But I will go ahead and I'm going to start. Thank you for starting the recording. So welcome to tonight. Um, tonight is really that celebration. Um, we have our three speakers tonight, George Ahern, who is our one of our three co-founders for East West Food Rescue, chairman of the board, and Farmer Relations and our Food Acquisition Director. Um, John Kunin is also going to be sharing um, on our organizational update and strategy. He is our Vice Chairman of the Board, uh, Director of Business and Development and Strategy. And Fia Tato, thank you so much for taking the time uh, coming from mega food distribution events. Uh, Fia is here and she is the founder and president of Lend a Hand Community Outreach. Um, so very, very grateful to all three of you uh, for joining us tonight and welcome to our guests as well. Um, and we'll go ahead and keep it moving. I wanted to kick this off though with a little video. Um, for those of you who do not know, we started um, in May of 2020 and it all started in a fellow. So pardon me for a second. We're going to play a little video. We are going to be having our uh, agenda tonight, starting out with a state of food insecurity, our priorities for 2021. Um, we're going to hear from our food agency partner, Fiatero, and also hearing about how our donations, um, how they make a difference and create a direct impact. And we also want a, a large opportunity uh, for questions and answers. So. With that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to George Ahern. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, as Julia mentioned, um, my as we started this uh, with my co-founders, Sophia Pastor and Nancy Balin, on April 29th, uh, 2020, um, I was reading in a local newspaper about food that was being wasted in my hometown of uh, Othello, Washington and the surrounding areas. Uh, you know, we always knew as kids that Eastern Washington could feed the world. There's just so much agriculture there. And um, I was getting frustrated because uh, my uh, best friends were losing their business due to COVID. They lost 75% uh, of their uh, clientele in, in a matter of 60 days, which is very impactful to any business. And my neighbors, uh, having had worked for a, a local uh, large Seattle firm, uh, after 15 years were getting laid off. So they were in danger of losing their home. And so I made this post of wasted food. Um, and I uh, was looking for a truck and just uh, 2000 pounds of food. Um, 
little did I know the the response that that would get in overwhelming fashion. And um, uh, I, th I thought 2000 pounds of food would just flood the market. You know, we, we'd come over here and just flood the market and feed a lot of people because, you know, as a friend said, um, uh, Sean, he was on the one of the first convoy. He was on the first convoy with me and he said, you know, a potato, that's a meal. <laughs> you add some onions and butter and and that and that, that's a meal like a potato is a, is a, is is good so we we uh we were very proud of the it was 9.36 tons over 18,000 pounds of food that we got that first day and the next day which was unbelievable i got a call from Zofia Pastor and um from Farmer Frog and she said can you do it again and i thought really that you okay so i made another call to the same potato farmer in eastern washington tara gold and i told him that i was going to you know get together a much larger convoy um that nancy and Sophia helped me uh, uh, uh helped me gather and we ended up coming back with about 120 140 000 pounds of food that next week and i you know, I, I was done. I thought that's perfect. You know, we, we flooded a region. There should not be for want of potato anywhere in the Pacific Northwest or onion. We got these beautiful softball size, what's called grade one onions in the industry. And, um, uh, you know, I thought we, we just flooded a region. And uh, two days later this time, it took her two days to get rid of the potatoes and onions. I got a call from Sophia out of Farmer Frog. And she said, can you do it again? I, 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 was, I was shocked, I was uh, astounded. And uh, I, I didn't believe her. And I said, there's, there's no way anybody needs a potato or onion in our region. There's 140,000 pounds, that's a lot. And she said, come out to the farm. <laughs> so that was actually my first journey out to the farm um, uh, the second week that we were in operation. And I came out to the farm and she says, George, do you see a potato? Do you see an onion? We need more food. And that's when it hit me the magnitude of what we were dealing with. Um, so I went out to the farm, saw this uh, massive operation of, of organized volunteers um, and getting together, bagging food, uh, feverishly bagging food uh, into 50 pound bags and um, uh, organizing it so that it can go out via trucks and other convoys um and so it was just it was just really really an amazing sight to see so we kept doing it week over week um you're welcome to change the slide julie if you like but we we kept doing it week over week um you know may 1st 2020 um there was essentially an acknowledgement of what was a broken supply chain of food uh over a billion pounds of potatoes became accessible to us I remember my first call to the onion supplier and I said, what could we have access to? And they said about half a million pounds. And I just, I just couldn't believe it. And believe me, they did not want to spend the money or the resources to get rid of that food. And uh, uh, they would rather uh, give it away, even though it was cheaper to, to uh, plow it under than it was to pick it and pack it and give it away. So um, that, was, that was a realization that we had to begin supporting these farmers. That was the, 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 uh, the hatching of that idea is that the, the, one of the scariest things that I heard in all this process was uh, when speaking to a potato farmer, a very large potato farmer in, in um, um, excuse me, Grant County, they're uh, Hooterite uh, 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 folks and they, they just have massive amounts of potatoes. And I asked him, what are you doing next season? And he said, uh, I'm growing 40% less crop next year. That scared me to no end because I knew the pandemic would, would continue. And I, I knew that the, you know, even if the restaurants did pick up, um, the demand would be there, but, but the supply wouldn't be there. We'd have an inverse of, of what we had in that 89 cent pound potatoes were, going to become $1.99 a pound in your local stores, which would put an additional strain on families um, 
who are food insecure. And so our, our, our goal then to became, became how are we going to support these farmers, encourage them to keep planting, and um, uh, we'll be discussing later on on how that's finally come to full circle and we're, we're really proud of that and 35.4 million pounds acquired and moved um, 20.3 million uh, meals provided uh, over 2.8 million different individuals um, you know just just an amazing effort by all that were had had their hand in it um, many many organizations as you can see um, the convoy is there um, uh, uh, excuse me, the, the food being loaded up on the trucks. Um, the seasons began to change and um, the, the produce began to change. Um, instead of watermelon, we were getting uh, butternut squash and um, we became essentially better organized and, and mobilized to uh, perform these larger and larger tasks and larger and larger duties. And um, uh, uh, one of the pictures in the last slide uh, uh, I really enjoy is the uh, the blueberries. Uh, we formed a gleaning group and we just had a blast picking, you know, a couple acres of, of blueberries. And that farmer in particular was overjoyed because his blueberries had not been picked. They'd gotten too big, too out of hand for him. And he loved to make blueberry wine. So he just called me the other day and what we did was what we picked, we gave half to the farmer and kept half for the food rescue. And uh, he said that his wine is now being featured at a local restaurant. So he was thrilled to have the production ability and to sell his wine that, that he wanted to sell. Thanks, Julie, I just wanted to get that out. <laughs> um, so we, we impacted 19 states um, by the end of the year with, with all of our partners um, and Washington remained as, as the main service state with uh, 16 million pounds just in Washington. And that was about 50% of what we had, um, we, we were able to move. Um, we were able to touch 19 different counties in Washington. Uh, the main, uh, the three main counties we served were King, Snohomish and Pierce. Uh, overall, 85% of the food was distributed to three Western states, Washington, California, Arizona. And uh, we work to keep things as fresh as possible. Um, the, 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 the milk that we got, although it wasn't a, a ton of milk, but the milk that we got was um, bottled the day before. And uh, the potatoes and onions that we got were, were, most of them were just pulled out of the ground recently, not even in storage that long. Um, uh, we, we stayed out of the pantry food space and um, we distributed um, to uh, many hungry recipients. Uh, excuse me for one quick second. I apologize, go ahead, Julia, next. No, I was just gonna say, I think that's a great transition. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and transition it over um, to, to John Cunin, um, who's gonna speak a little bit more in depth about our partners and the 700 plus food and agencies as well that we had the privilege to be able to work with. Thank you, Julia. George, do you want to just talk through the partners for a minute, and then I'll talk about with the food agencies? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's it's important to the number to understand that uh, these numbers that we post in 2020 is through the work of many many partnerships that we are eternally grateful for, and um, we work. One of the one of the um, uh, differentiators for East West Food Rescue is that. We we're able to work in and out organizations larger than us and smaller than us, and and uh, not just take but also also give. And uh, obviously, Farmer Frog was our, our absolute main partner in 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 distributing all these foods. As Zofia was the, is a co-founder of the East West Food Rescue and our distribution director at the time. And um, uh, they worked extremely long, hard hours in all different weather condition air, air, um, conditions to passionately and caringly feed our neighbors. And um, Harvest Against Hunger, who's on there as well, they took over our um, main uh, trucking issues that we had. Logistics is everything for moving food across the state. 
um, uh, getting it to uh, different locations. And then you had um, uh, uh, food banks, large food banks like Emergency Food Network and larger in which we were able to uh, work with them and get, um, get uh, food that was about to, uh, that they were unable to unload. But in addition, they were happy to take whatever it was that we had um, if it fit their warehouse space. And uh, with that organization mobilization I talked about earlier, along came the food boxes. And we found ourselves in the exact right place at the right time to handle the chaos of the food boxes. I remember uh, with every month, the, the contracts would change. And Sophia and I would be feverishly discussing about you know, uh, how we were going to search for or food boxes and one time we actually called a vendor of the new phase of food boxes and they didn't even realize that they were awarded the contract. So we, we beat them to the punch. We called them, had a meeting with them and they had no idea what we were talking about. They called us back a day later and said, oh, now we know what you're talking about. And then you have uh, wonderful groups like INSP, grassroots organization that moved right along with us with the response to the pandemic. Lend a Hand has been doing this. Uh, Fia uh, Taito, you're gonna hear from. She's been doing this. Uh, she's gonna be a speaker shortly um, uh, for quite some time. Praise Aluya Church Organization, the Slavic community and, and the Muckleshoot tribe, uh, Indian tribe, uh, the Salish people we've been um, uh, working with to help, you know, just uh, help not only be a recipient, but really strengthen our partnership on, and how we can help move food into the region. So these are the food distributed by food agency type, uh, faith-based organizations, community organizations, Native American tribes, food banks, and all others. But, but um, you know, you, you would think that food banks are, would be number one on this list and receiving and really, uh, uh, John, I'd love for you to take this on, but I think you'd agree that the pandemic sort of uh, opened up a, um, the, the bandage as to what, what, what areas that food banks had trouble with um, delivering food in, you know, to all these new folks needing assistance. So, hey folks, so it's, it's John Cunin here. So George, George, thank you. Um, so yeah, it was it was an interesting scenario that was occurring with the pandemic, and we'll talk about this in the next couple of slides, but with sort of the explosion of food insecurity, all of a sudden a lot of food banks reached capacity. They didn't have enough room to hold additional food. They figuratively did not have enough doors to help many new uh, food insecure recipients. And so you had an interesting dynamic occurring. If, if you look at the first three groups, especially the first two with faith-based faith -based groups and community organizations that had not been in sort of the food relief business were all of a sudden pivoting and getting involved because they realized we needed to help our, our community. So it was an interesting dynamic. And so also as a result, then what we saw is that a lot of food skewed to those food agency types. And we feel that it's very important to serve these groups because they're serving uh, in a fairly innovative way, more people um, and actually getting to them in sometimes very effective means. Julia, can you go on to the next slide? So this is actually the next section. And this, this talks about what is the status of food insecurity right now here in the United States. And this is a slide um, out of the New York Times. The New York Times in September did a photojournal essay. And I think this picture is quite apropos as to whom food insecurity uh, affects um, more predominantly. And as you can see, it often is families or children, uh, women, uh, the BIPOC community, black indigenous uh, people of color and, and single parents. And the question you may say is, what is food insecurity? And so the definition is a household is generally considered food insecure when insufficient quantities of nutritious food are unaffordable. Our research showed both secondary and some of our own is that when those who are experiencing food insecurity are fed, they can, they're can they able to pay other things more effectively, the rent, the car installments, the utilities. They tell us that they can make better decisions. Their kids can focus on school. They can get their medications refilled. 
there's some data out there that says for those who are food insecure, they're 50% more likely to go to an emergency room in a hospital. And I think the point is, is collectively, if we can work to help feed the hungry, you can really stave off a lot of other sort of downstream consequences. Um, Julie, if you can go to the next slide. These were also some pictures uh, from the photojournalism um, essay from the New York Times. Thought this was an interesting thing. A lot of the comments, and it's hard to see this, is that um, many individuals, as you see in these pictures, were part of families that were food insecure for the very first time last year due to the pandemic. It's an interesting, cute picture of the kid looking up here, but it, you know, again, a serious situation uh, where families say nothing can go to waste. When they can get food, they need to store everything. And you see all those bottles, um, um, cartons of milk being frozen. And you know, it's, to me, it's just crushing to see all these children hungry and the growth of food insecurity. And so what were the numbers? Julie, if you could go to the next slide, please. So overall, um, there's been a, a lot of the data kind of concurred that if before the pandemic, about one out of eight Americans were hungry, they were food insecure, and it doubled last year um, to one out of four. And uh, if we can go to the next slide, um, the, you know, follow the data over time. And this, some of the best data comes from the U.S. Census Bureau from the pulse surveys. And in green are all households. And if you can look at from about 2007 to all the way up to about 2020, actually, food insecure security beforehand was, was about 12%. It's a little bit lower on that, on your arrow, Julia. And, um, and it was sort of stabilizing and going down. But again, it's still a high level at 12%. And then boom, with the pandemic, with many people getting laid off, it doubled to about 25%. Uh, over time, it might have dropped. And at other times, what was happening is we had second and third waves of, uh, of COVID. And so again, then at times we would regress. If you look at the line above that with households for children, food insecurity reached a height of about 30 um, or 31%. And so what's occurring with food insecurity now, if we go to the next slide, we also look at the household um, survey from the US Census Pulse Survey, and this is the Northwestern group. Um, it is starting to prove, improve some, but it's interestingly, last year, we didn't see as fast enough improvement with some of the economy. And the reason being is a lot of families assets um, started, uh, started becoming deplete, uh, depleted. Um, so it's a challenging situation. So the stimulus packages help help some, but really if I call your attention to the red line with households for children, it's dropped, um, but it's still at 25%. So right now today, about a quarter of all families with children are hungry. And so, you know, it's a shame. And so if we go to the next slide and we wanna chat with you a little bit about 2021 with our current plans and work. And so May 1st, we celebrated our anniversary and we were uh, very fortunate to be on King 5 News um, where they did a short segment on our anniversary. And if we look at the last 12 months for our food tally, um, all those numbers uh, came in and for the first 12 months, for our anniversary, we collectively moved as a team here and partners, 54.2 million pounds. And so that's 43 million meals. So if you think about it, you know, um, the Rose Bowl in Pasadena holds about 100,000 people. If all of those folks were food insecure, that would be enough to serve 43 meals to all of that stadium. And again, this would be healthy food. And take a look at those pears. This was at a recent event in, I believe it was um, Puyallup. And this, again, healthy, uh, healthy food, not stadium food, as we'd like to say. So if you go to the next slide, our focus for, 2000, for 2021 and our strategy, I want to spend some time on this. So what's key is what we felt is remaining flexible and nimble in this sort of fluid uh, food system environment. This landscape is rapidly changing. So one of the advantages we have at East West Food Rescue 
is that we don't have a brick and mortar um, facility. We all work from home. We're in a virtual environment. It's an interesting world now in a, post, in a, in a pandemic or a post-pandemic world here is that many businesses and organizations here are sort of operating in this virtual landscape. Uh, we're all volunteers. And so we don't have a lot in the way of fixed costs. And so that when we do need to change and pivot, that makes it a lot easier um, to address our mission and strategy when we see new opportunities or when we need to act, when we find out that we're exiting ones that are no longer effective. If you think about traditional food banks and traditional food relief organizations, you know, they've been doing great work for many years, but we don't necessarily operate like a bureaucratic traditional food bank or a food relief organization that can be slow to change. And so this landscape is, is changing and that's key. Part of our focus for 2021 is, is following an 80-20 rule. It's Pareto's law is keeping a focus on what are some high gain things that we can do that can drive 80% of the outcomes to serve, our, serve those with food insecurity. So we're a lean organization and an all volunteer organization and that's key for focus. And so one of those things it's key is focusing on our farm acquisition strengths. And George will talk about on the next slide, our innovative farmer collaborations. But if we look at, if we look at East West Food Rescue and we, we, we took a sharp look back to last year, what do we do really well? It's around our farmer acquisition. Our, what we do well is acquiring um, grade one quality nutrition excess produce that can and dairy and protein protein that can feed many people uh, at a cost that can feed many people. What we try to do on average is to acquire food for about 10 cents per pound. And so that's not easy. Um, but through a combination of our purchases and our donations, uh, we were able to achieve that. And last year, as a matter of fact, we were able to achieve that at six cents a pound. Right now we're averaging about nine cents. And what I'll reiterate is we really strive for a balance of food. So it's not just potatoes and onions and apples, but it's whole, you know, it's greens, uh, carrots um, uh, and fruit. One of the other things we're doing is you look at the fourth bu um, um, bullet is diversifying our distribution. And so we decided uh, in 2021, it's important to use many different distributors. A number of these distributors operate a lot like a food agency, but we'll also sort it to distribute food to hungry uh, recipients, um, but also these uh, food agencies can distribute to a number of other um, smaller food agencies. And for our sustainability, we felt it was important to keep a geographic focus in our home area in, in Washington and in the Northwest for the time being. And so Julie, if you go to the next slide, what was laid out in our impact report, what we're, what we're doing and what we're keeping the focus on in summary is to really purchase crops to support farmers and bring free, free food to the community food agency organizations. Some of our goals for this year, year are to expand uh, our 2021 distribution and logistics so that we can bring more food to smaller food agencies, but continue to support community food agencies. One of the more interesting things that we're striving for and really starting to do now are some of these grassroots farmer uh, um, growing arrangements. And George, to that end, I'm gonna turn it over to you to have you about your growth plan. Yeah, thanks, John. And if I miss anything, feel free to key me in. Um, but basically, um, we're working with farmers on a much different level now, and we're very excited about uh, what's going to come this summer and, and fall. But um, we now have um, farmers growing about 11 acres of crops for just, uh, just us, just the East West Food Rescue and for our um, towards a mutual benefit and purpose. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means that farmers can now um, uh, uh, experiment. Uh, I had a farmer when we explained this concept and he said, wait a minute, I've been wanting to grow uh, cabbage uh, for a while now. You mean I can plant three acres of cabbage, you'll cover my costs uh, from seed, fertilizer, water, picking and packing, and, um, and you'll cover my cost and 
I can then work towards growing a new crop, which he's been looking to get new contracts for. I said, absolutely. And, you know, it's nice because when they understand that your goals are mutually aligned as an organization, the, you know, the answer comes to yes, very quickly. And so, um, so we have another farmer call us and say, um, I have a bare patch of eight acres. What do you want me to plant? And um, we told her, um, uh, uh, you know, how about some winter squash? So we're looking forward to uh, either kombucha or butternut squash or possibly a combination of both. And um, not only that, but they were able to make introductions for us on the seed manufacturers. And so now we're talking to the seed manufacturers, just trying to move it down the line to essentially say, can we get um, the seeds for wholesale or, or, um, uh, or no cost? And um, another way we're working with the farmers uh, is, is a, a rancher. We had um, done something that was kind of, but not really related to food uh, rescue. It was, a, we found out about the Whitney fire uh, and everyone was, you know, hearing about the fire in Okanagan, but there was a fire in Lincoln County. Uh, if you imagine from Bellevue to Everett, a fire that long, and I honestly don't know how wide, but that was essentially the Whitney fire in, in uh, Lincoln County. And hay and um, what the ranchers called their groceries for their, for their, for their cattle, for their steer, uh, was just being uh uh, was destroyed. And we found a rancher who lost uh, over 40 ton of hay. Uh, it was his fall pasture. And we made him whole. We had uh, uh, volunteers donating hay all the way from Aberdeen, Washington, which makes no sense to send someone from Snohomish to Aberdeen out to Lincoln County and Odessa, Washington, to then drive back home. Makes no sense, but it made sense to us because we were able to make that rancher whole and it was, it was really a, a great thing. And he was extremely happy uh, and we've kept in communication. And when the time came right, uh, we had a discussion about um, using his, uh, his, his steer, his cattle for uh, food donation for the, the food rescue. And we're basically getting these things uh, at cost and we'll be delivering uh, hopefully very shortly here. I'm just waiting for the call from the butcher, but we'll be de delivering about two to two and a half tons of hay and that will uh, benefit um, uh, uh, the, the uh, Salish tribe in, in the uh, Salish people in, in, the, in the region. And um, uh, so just what that does for the rancher is they then know ahead of time that their cattle is, is essentially sold and they can make plants sooner to rent pasture that's needed uh, to continue uh, on with their herd so that they are then in a position financially to not have to compete with other ranchers uh, every year to rent out pasture. They're always looking for the best pasture um, uh, plots of land to rent or to lease. Uh, another thing we're doing in discussion is talking to three farmers about supplying hoop houses for them. Uh, if you don't know what a hoop house is, um, there's another term, I can't remember um, the name of it, but uh, it's essentially a giant uh, greenhouse. It's very wide and very long, and um, they're able to plant uh, in there year round. And if you plant the right types of things, you can get like leafy greens uh, essentially all, all year round. Um, so these, these would be... Um, uh, gifts to the farmer in, in, in working with, uh, with them to then continue to bring food to their area or possibly even transport it back over the mountains. But I think we would connect with local food banks and local areas to continually support these nutri nutrient dense foods. Um, was there anything else, John, about that? Well, that's, that's George, good. I think that was a perfect transition because I heard you say the word gifts. And our, one of our huge gifts has been in our partnerships. Um, and if we are, are good, I'd love to transition it over um, and give the virtual microphone over to, to Fia Tero with uh, Lead to Hand Community Outreach to share a bit about her organization, the work and how um, they have partnered with East West Food Rescue. So Fia, it's all you. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. I'm just really so excited to hear all the, the happenings that's been going on since uh, this pandemic. And I know even before the um, before the pandemic, um, there's been a lot of things that have been built up to the point where um, it has just been quite of a journey. And so um, I'm sitting over here, I'm just soaking in all the, the goods and uh, the deeds that have been done uh, within the communities and just the amazing partnerships that, um, you know, to be on this platform, um, it is it is just mind blowing um, with everything that we've we've experienced um, coming on board and just partnering up with East West Food Rescue alongside with um, several other amazing nonprofits that have been um, locking arms with us and making things happen and just moving mountains uh, even during uh, the pandemic. So um, where do I begin? Uh, so we started uh, Lend a Hand Community Outreach in uh, 2018. Um, we believe it or not, this outreach has birthed out from uh, birth out from a music ministry. My family and I um, have always had the music thing way before Lendahan Community Outreach uh, started, and so um, my husband and I have had some conversations about the music with the message, and um, you know with the whole singing thing, um, there was much more to it. Um, for those of you who love music, uh, music is a powerful tool. Um, it also sends out a message, whether it's a, a message of hope, you know, when you're going through some struggles and things, uh, music for me personally, it helps me to, to cope with things in life. And so um, taking it to another level, um, having the conversation with my husband, uh, hey, you know what? I think, you know, with how music inspires us and with the messages, the positive messages that we are, are, are getting from these music, there's much more to it. And so from there on, uh, we have taken that experience of um, with the positive music or Christian, whether it's gospel or any music that is inspiring and taking it to where we're going to put the music to action. So instead of just having that platform of singing, we're going to take the singing to a whole nother level. So uh, hence, uh, Lend a Hand Community Outreach uh, started in 2018. Um, but for me, I've always had the passion of serving. And so whether it's uh, growing up, some people may think it's weird, but I've always had this thing about, you know, um, pleasing people. I've always wanted to make sure that when I do something for someone, um, I always want to make sure that I go the extra mile. So I think, you know, just all in all, um, when we started this outreach, um, I didn't know what to expect, but the name speaks for itself. And it always has been the, the, the name that has been, um, ringing in my ear like for some time I just didn't know how or what this whole lend hand thing was going to look like uh, so from the music to the outreach from the outreach to starting um, we started doing outreach in uh, by preparing meals for the homeless so um, speaking of that uh, I've always had this thing where I, where every time when we drive with my kids picking up, whether it's picking up my kids from school, um, I would always see like someone, an individual hang, you know, holding up the sign, uh, homeless, wanting to eat. I've always been like, you know, I'm trying to like look for quarters, coins or something that's in my vehicle and we just hand it out to them, whether it's a dollar, a penny or a quarter. You know, I've always had that uh, urgency of like, you know, it's, it's a need. I'm going to there's no, there's no questions asked. You see someone that's in need, you just act right away. So um, with that being said, um, starting the outreach by preparing meals for the homeless, I reached out to my family and I said, okay, so who's gonna, who's gonna help me? I'm gonna be feeding the homeless. And so uh, we started uh, preparing meals for the homeless uh, and just connecting with people. I'm always, everywhere we go, we've always looked out for, well, at least I've started looking up for opportunities where, okay, so this lend a hand thing, what does it look like? And um, 
and the heart to just help people in any way, um, whether it's preparing the meals. Um, it was always uh, looking out for ways to help. And even if people don't ask, I'm always looking for somebody where, you know, um, and it's crazy because that's always been something that my kids would always come to me and say, mom, not all the time you're going to give people something. You have to be careful. Like even late at night when we we're just to go to get gas and whatnot, um, they would have this concern about, you know, um, it's not all the time you, you have to ask and, you know, you have to be careful too for safety. But anyways, um, but that's sort of how it started. Um, and then just coming from preparing meals for the homeless uh, into a community of just looking for uh, places where now it's from one individual to two, I really wanted to like serve the homeless community, you know, like to where, okay, I don't wanna just serve one person or two. I really wanna go out and look for where there's really a, a community of, of people where we can make these meals and go out and just go, go feed them. So anyways, long story short, from there on, um, we, we, we've been doing that for some time in 2018 for a good a year and a half. Um, it, it came to a point where I'm like, you know what? Uh, since we've been doing this thing out of like, you know, because we had to spend out of our own pockets. So there was no way, you know, people are made out of money all the time. So I'm like, you know, as, as time progresses and as I realized that the need is great, um, there had to be a way there had, there has to be a way where we can reach out and ask for and seek for help to where we can really, uh, look at opportunities and ways on how we can really work together, not just us, but also to uh, connect with people that are resourceful. So anyways, uh, in 2019, we became, finally became a nonprofit, but even then there was a great need. And we all know that uh, when COVID-19 pandemic began, um, you know, to ripple through, of course, Washington state, causing a lot of physical, financial, uh, devastation among a lot of families. We've learned that. Uh, we saw that the usual channels of uh, food relief were being overloaded. And so, uh, you know, even with food banks, food banks, food pantries, and school based uh, food help with families, uh, whether it's overwhelmed or disrupted by closures, uh, we were ready. We were ready. And we just knew that we were able to help on a greater scale uh, than we have ever ima imagined. So, we quickly pivoted into a large scale of food distribution through um, Sophia. So mind you how this all started, just to kind of recap on how everything sort of started. It was crazy because uh, I got a random email one day and uh, usually I would scroll through my emails. And if I see something that is just, you know, if I don't see anything that I'm expecting to show up in an email, I would just easily delete it. But the key that made me check this email was food. I saw food and I instantly clicked on it and boom, the email just showed up. Uh, it said, sorry, we're not gonna be open on Labor Day uh, for you to pick up your food. But mind you, I've never, I've never met Sophia. I don't know East West Food Rescue. I've never, you know, I don't know Farmer Fog, nada. And I'm like, Okay, so I quickly just glanced through the email and went all the way down to look for a cell number. If I don't see a cell number, if I only see 1-800 number, then I'm not going to even waste my time. I need to see a direct line. So there you have it. Saw the cell phone. I quickly dialed in. It went to her voicemail and left a message shortly after uh, Sophia called. That's when, that's when the conversation started. So from there on... <laughs> From there on, uh, she asked me, okay, so what do you, what do you need? And I said, well, I'm over here in, uh, you know, in Pierce County and uh, I need food to bring so I can feed some people that are here. So mind you, she said, wow, this is amazing. Where exactly are you? I said, Pierce County. And she said, we've been looking for someone there in the Pierce County to take food. And I said, okay, sure. I can come pick up food in my Durango. Uh, not knowing that uh, shortly after that, she said, well, what if I send you a semi? I said, what? And I didn't know it was like, you know, in the semi had like loads of food, right? 
you're talking about a thousand thousand plus I didn't even know that so she said yes I'm gonna send you a semi and she's and I just instantly said yes without even thinking or anything mind you I don't have a warehouse I don't have a place for all of this but that's sort of how everything began and took off from there so from what happened to be a, a semi um turned to be two three four five um uh, what a one-day operation started off with uh went from one day operation, two, three, four, five, to where it, it, I know, right? It's crazy. But anyways, that's how it sort of started. Um, we ended up uh, distributing over 6,000 plus combo boxes. That's not including all the, the donations that we have been receiving within the five days a week that we have been uh, operating since we started this. So eight months in, uh, last year alone, from August to December, we have served well over 2,500 individuals, including men, women, uh, senior community, uh, moving for the first time uh, between one to two million pounds. I know that's nothing compared to what East West Food Rescue, you know, and Farmer Frog and all the other amazing uh, organizations, but I feel that this is, this has been just an amazing journey. Um, and how and how this last year, you know, sharing the partnership with uh, East West Food Rescue have really made a huge difference. And it's just so exciting to know that uh, when I had reached out to uh, George uh, about our mega before we started our mega, I sent him a message and didn't even think that he was going to get back. Like, because, you know, and to be honest, I thought oh, they're big. So there's no way he's going to get back to me, you know, but he reached out like right right at the very moment when we when I was like I'm planning this mega I know it's crazy it's a three-day mega I don't know how things are going to look like but I need help so I reached out to George and that's when George came you know uh reached back to me I had to hold my composure because I didn't want to get all so excited to where you know I didn't want George to think that oh my gosh he's weird but anyways I'm just saying I'm just saying <laughs> you know but Thank you guys so much. Uh, you know, there's so much to talk about, but with time, um, I just wanted to thank you guys uh, for just um, partnering up with us and making a huge difference because you have no idea how you just making that effort to support us in every way possible, even if it's the food, whether it's the food or just even our banners. Thank you guys so much, uh, Julia, for asking the question, because you have no idea, even with that uh, effort of just, you know, helping us with our banners with Kelly Connect, you see connection is so important. And um, within that, uh, the whole partnership thing, it, it has the, the connection, the, uh, the, the building of relationship, and uh, just, you know, being a blessing of, of having this opportunity to, to you know, to partner with you, uh, we also want to bless the community in that way. So um, sorry for taking so much time, but there's so no, much. That's a beautiful story. Yeah. No, no, no. We yeah. had comments like, say, Senator, yeah, seriously, applause. Um, Thank you. It's a huge blessing. And everything you said is wholly reciprocated. And I don't know if Sophia is still on the call, but, you know, just massive in, in her ability to like, connect right after sending yes. out any sort whether big or small and that goes to our mission caringly feeding our neighbors in need um truly believe that so that's why we do it so thank you for all you do and for sharing fia um and i will say when she says mega she's talking about a mega food distribution event <laughs> these were mega huge events so um i'm gonna have here a slide with how to um Check out Lend a Hand, see their photos, follow them on, on Facebook. Um, you'll get their update through us as well. Um, but at this time, I'm going to go ahead and kind of. Um, thank you, Julie. Yes. I, can, I can jump in. Perfect. And Fia, Fia, thank and we'll you. leave some time for some questions, hopefully. Very inspirational. So, so here's our ask. Um, you know, hunger is not going away anytime soon. Uh, the pandemic may be getting better. We're not able to, you know, um, mass policy. I was surprised how quickly that that changed. But you know, um, you know, food insecurity is not going to go away really anytime soon until our economy really broadly improves um, to help a lot of different folks. It's not going to go away. And I got to tell you, before the pandemic, it was really bad enough. And so again, we need your financial support. 
for food acquisition. As George outlined, we've got some interesting innovative food agreements with farmers. We'd like to invest in hoop houses. If you look in the right hand circle here, you know, a $500 gift allows us to acquire about 5,000 pounds of food on average, and that would provide 4,000 meals. So an interesting fact, I think yesterday, our 2020 taxes were due. Well, for 2021, um, even if you don't itemize, if you file jointly, you can make a $600 um, gift to a nonprofit um, a charitable organization and still get a tax deduction. So, you know, we'd love it if all of you could, could think about a donation like that. If not, you know, a $100 gift will, will allow us to acquire about a thousand pounds of food, providing 800 meals. Um, we also, if you want to help out um, in other ways, we do need some talented staff volunteers. Um, we're looking for folks that can give a little bit of time every week. And if they have sales or marketing or nonprofit backgrounds or management backgrounds. Um, but we also have, we're also looking to doing some gl uh, gleaning events where farmers open up their fields, just like George showed those blueberries um, for, they, they need folks to pick um, their food where they're donating it. And so if you're interested, please email us on this. And so um, to donate, you know, just at, just at our website of eastwestfoodrescue.org. Perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and stop our screen share. I'm going to ask, um, because I was just very moved by the story. I didn't want to interrupt Via. Um, if our speakers and presenters can stay for an extra five or 10 minutes, um, since we are getting close to 730, for those who can stay on and have questions, um, I want to open it up to uh, the floor to just pop your question in the chat and we can read it out. Um, Via, are you, George, John, can you guys stay on for another yeah, I'm good. Five minutes. Perfect. Um, one question um, that we had come in already was, um, what are some, and this is for, we can start with Fia and East West, but what are some large projects that you're looking to fund and what will those projects impact? I've heard things from trucks to hoop houses um, and either East West or lend a hand if Go ahead, George. It, was that for FIA specifically or was that for just no, in general? No, it was a general. Okay. Well, I know I know FIA is working on something, but um, I, um, uh, I think the key is sustainability. We have to make this a sustainable model to go on and on and on and on and on. Um, we've, we've known for some time, over eight months, uh, that the food boxes would eventually end. And that was the bulk of the, that all those pounds that you saw. So we're, we've been working hard to shift to sustainable model and sustainable relationships. So uh, the hoop houses are a great start. You know, these things aren't cheap. It's not like buying a little greenhouse for your backyard. They're up to $25,000 each. Um, uh, so um, if you know any corporate sponsors that would love their name on a hoop house, <laughs> you know, have them give us a call. Um, we've seriously considered trucking as a need. Um, uh, to help us move food eat more easily when our trucking partners are unable to, um, or the cost has just gotten so extraordinary. Um, we had, we've had to face that recently. So um, I'd be happy to, if anyone wanted to talk about larger projects, uh, if you want to give Julia your, your information there, I'd, I'd be happy to call you uh, directly, but we are looking at sustainable projects to go far beyond, um, um, you know, um, far beyond a, a one-time pass of- We've grown food. a lot since the uh, first round of potato for the first pickup. How about um, Fia, same question. Any, what, what do you have kind of cooking? So uh, there's, there's a few things. Um, and when I say this, it's just from the experience of being out there and uh, so right now we're serving uh, five counties, uh, which includes uh, Keene, Pierce, uh, Thurston, Clark, and Kitsap. So, um, and the amazing thing is that uh, what I've been uh, learning is that uh, building and engaging with the communities and finding out the needs of the communities and how we can better serve, um, aside from 
having the food available, uh, like what George uh, mentioned about the sustainability, which is very important. We have to uh, find ways on how we can continue to have these uh, food uh, coming in so that we can continue to, to support our communities, especially during these hard times. So um, there's several things like for us, right now we don't have a, a facility. We're operating currently from a church facility that's been open to us since August of last year. Um, thankfully that um, uh, the pastors there are good friends of ours. And so they've opened uh, some space for us to utilize for the time being, but everything else, believe it or not, uh, the food that's been coming in has been moved. Like we have to move the food, but, um, and then also it's a blessing to connect. This is why when I mentioned connection and how important that is, is that you never know who you come across. And so uh, right now uh, we do have a, a trucking business. My husband runs a trucking business, which we have two trucks that are available, but we don't own trailers. Um, the trailers that we have been using are have been contributed the use of these trailers so that we can re, uh, keep the food uh, refrigerated and especially with perishable food that we have been receiving. Um, that's how we were able to keep the food uh, secured and making sure that, um, you know, with the with the um, what is it? What is it called? But you know what I mean? So that's how we we've been operating um, everything. Our warehouse right now is outside. I'll, that's what I tell people because they ask the questions like, how do you guys keep all this food? You know, are you guys able to move all this food? But it's just a matter of um, not everybody wants to do be out there and, you know, feed the community, but someone has to do it. Right. And so um, people like you, amazing leaders like you, um, we look up to you, those who have access to food and what we've been uh, really exposed to the community and letting them know that, um, we have to utilize every uh, resources that we have. And it's not about taking away from the people, but it's about coming together, utilizing the resources that we have so that we can make a greater impact. And what that looks like is resources that we have, like East West Food Rescue, whatever food that we have, we're grateful. We can take that food and use it to the best way we know how. And uh, just feed people, get the word out there, share with them, because people don't realize that the work that um, is done behind the scene, they, they're only looking at what's in the front. But behind that, I mean, we're moving food back and forth in trailers. There's a lot of work that it takes um, in order to get that food from point A to point B. So, and a lot of the times it's, a, it's an emotional journey. And I'm saying this because some nights, it's just me and my husband moving that food. We don't we don't say that because and it's okay. Uh, they don't need to know. But if you really want to know the inside story of what happens behind the scene, it's it's we need a we need a make, documentary like a behind the scenes documentary. Yeah, <laughs> over and like I feel that three days. Important. Yes, it's important because a lot of you there's details to the work there's every part that plays in what makes you know the food goes out there because it's not just us going out there to distribute the food Absolutely. if that and it's so complex as well and it this leads into a question that we had from Andrew um Andrew was asking you know what is kind of the status of farmers and the impacts post pandemic and just essentially and um we'll just take a few more minutes but what is the future of food supply uh, our farm acquisition director. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a great uh, question. Crystal ball. And, I'm sorry. Crystal ball. crystal ball. Well, what's nice about that? I'm so glad you said crystal ball because what's nice about that is I don't have. One. And also, what's nice about that is we are coming full circle on a year, so we kind of have one. We have a roadmap. We know watermelon are coming. We know butternut squash are coming. We know the strawberries are coming. We missed, uh, I think, asparagus last year, you know, because of the timing and when we got started. So we're, we're, we're able to attack those things. So that part, we do have a crystal ball on what's coming. The status of food is prior to the pandemic, there was a ton of wasted food in this country a ton of wasted food in this country. And that, that was it from day one, you know, I know where, you know, some farmers are and I know where some hungry people are, let's connect those dots. And I think we'll be able to continue to connect those dots 
um, but more more effectively and, and more efficiently and with better relationships with the farmers. So I, I appreciate the question, Andrew, very much. Julia, can I add, add some to this? I'm sort of amazed at how much we still see as excess food at, you know, from farmers, this, the things that are just not sold. If you think about food that comes out that's not cosmetically beautiful, that can't go to the retail market, that that is just perfectly nutritious, it's it's good food. And a lot of times this happens at the last minute um, that all of a sudden you've got this excess supply. And it's really helpful to work with organizations like FIA and a lot of these more grassroots organizations, because a lot of times food banks can only take so much and are fairly rigid as to what they can do. And so it's amazing what you can do if you're just flexible and nimble to take advantage of that. And I think this is sort of the real value prop, um, not trying to toot our horn, but I think the, the value prop of, of being able to get food that's great quality and to get it to groups that can move it very quickly and to get it into the hands of the hungry. So let's go ahead and have time for one last question. Uh, this is from Beth and it's what percentage of food goes east versus west? You have numbers on that? I, I apologize. I don't have the numbers on that uh, directly, uh, but I know that's something that we've been wanting to expand upon, you know, since day one. Uh, I, <laughs> um, it's always been a goal when we have these private convoys we would have them, what in the trucking term is deadheading. These private convoys would head over to um, uh, uh, Eastern Washington to get the food. And, and uh, it just so happens, I posted a memory on my Facebook page today of us um, sending food back over. It wasn't much, but it was canned tuna, which is what they were asking. They didn't want potatoes. They didn't want onions. They, they, they had enough, uh, they had access to all those things. Cherries, they don't want cherries, you know. Uh, Bellingham doesn't want blueberries. They have access to those things. So it's circulating the food in a way that's, that makes sense. But we're also building partnerships with, with groups in Spokane um, to be recipients and which actually helps us out quite a bit because then we don't have to move the food so far. And that's the hope of the hoop houses. If we can build hoop houses in, in both sides of the state, um, we have to look at some logistics on that with weather, et cetera, but then we can keep the food local. We don't have to worry or work on long range transportation. We can look at keeping the food local. If, if Indian tribes want hoop houses on their land, if you know, uh, the, the food stays local. And then also it provides training opportunities for people in that area. You know, um, uh, there's a young man that works with vets and he trains vets on how to grow food. I mean, how cool is that? You know, and he, he um, you know, he wants to give us food, but uh, logistics is, is, a, is an issue getting, getting the food from him, but we're working on that. So um, the percentage isn't enough. I'll, I'll be the first to say that, but it's something that we're constantly, you know, trying to improve. And I think by es establishing those food pipelines and those farmer acquisitions and those contracts, we're going to be able to better know we're not going to be as re reactive um, yeah. to the available. We'll be, be, able, be able to plan. Um, perfect. Well, on that note, any final from our, our speakers or final questions? All right. Thank well, I'm going to go ahead and joining us tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and share our, our final screen here. So on oh. here, how to get in touch with our amazing speakers tonight um, and just saying thank you so much for joining us. Um, George Ahern, John Kunin, Fia Tato, thank you for all the work that you do and commitment and thank you to everyone who was able to, to join us tonight and we're going to send this out as well uh, to the folks who were able to join.